You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, folks, I really don't want to do this broadcast. I had had something completely different that I was going to do, but uh, things that are breaking and information that has just come in within the last half hour uh, has to be aired. But first, let me get to... Uh, let me see here. Let me get to uh, these Constitution Party meetings. There'll be a Constitution Party meeting in Missouri on June the 14th, Wednesday, June 14th, at the Kearney Branch Library at 6.30, that's 630 West Kearney, Springfield, Missouri. For information, call Tom at 417-889-5988. That's Tom at 417-889-5988. Eight, eight. By the way, people are beginning to trickle in for the conference next week. It's going to be dynamite. Constitution Party meeting in San Mateo County, California. There's a voice mailbox with directions to Alpha Beacons Library. And this uh, voice mailbox will be set up Tuesday. The number is 415-568-2666. Nine. <laughs> oh my goodness, I can't believe it. He sent me all the information that doesn't have the date on it. Uh, what is going on here? Folks, you got to get it together. I mean, this is uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me see. Well, oh yeah, Saturday, June 10th. Okay, Saturday, June 10th. There will be a Constitution Party meeting in San Mateo County, California. The voice mailbox will not be connected until Tuesday. The number is 415-568-2669. That's Tuesday. You can call this number, 415-568-2669, and get directions. Um, also, there's... Uh, uh, another number you can call and ask for directions to the Alpha Beacon Library in San Mateo County, California. And that number, you can call that tomorrow, 415-592-2811. That's 415-592-2811. Or you can write, and uh, they'll send you directions, the Constitution Party of San Mateo County, 204 East 2nd Avenue, Number 743, that's 204 East 2nd Avenue, number 743, San Mateo, California, 94401. Again, that's the Constitution Party of San Mateo County, 204 East 2nd Avenue, number 743, San Mateo, California, 94401. Apparently, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't know any more than this at the present time, someone has shot a Secret Service uh, agent and another person. We don't know who that person is or whether they're employed by the government or not. On the grounds of the White House, I told you that these things would escalate. I wish that I was wrong. I really don't like to tell you this. I've got a lot more to tell you. Don't go away. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a loud knock on your door. Hey, something's not right. 
Well, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to cut that short, folks. We're going to leave the facts connected through this broadcast. We will not be taking any calls. I've got too much information to impart. And uh, just in case there are some uh, developments, please fax it to us immediately. I have somebody on the fax machine uh, to get it as soon as it comes in. And uh, I hope nothing worse happens. Okay. Things are coming to light. Edie Smith, the mother of two very tiny boys who were killed in the bombing in Oklahoma City, is really stirring up a fuss. She got the Communist News Network, CNN, coverage today asking the world why she couldn't get answers from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms about why they were out of the office on April 19th. She said she had been told by federal officials to shut up and not ask any questions. I'm going to say that again. She said she had been told by federal officials to shut up and not ask any questions. She said she feels threatened, but she's not going to be quiet. She and all of the other families are going to ask these questions until they get some answers. Edie gave a much more detailed, lengthy airing of her grievances on local television in Oklahoma City, all of which will be on a videotape that's being sent to us, uh, which will be here, and you will be able to see that if you're here for the conference, along with a lot of other things that, uh, that those of you out there in Radio Land cannot uh, see or hear about this Oklahoma City bombing, but those who attend the conference will. Uh, also, Dan Rather said he had, quote, inside the compound, unquote, footage tonight on CBS News from Elohim City. And uh, <laughs> uh, this is incredible, folks. We learned today that there are about 75 members of that community living in the, quote, compound, unquote, they're setting these people up for another Waco. And I'm telling you right now, there will never be another Waco in this country. So get ready. Last but never least, Timothy McVeigh. FBI are trying to bring in a foreign connection. Can you believe this? FBI are trying to bring in a foreign connection. The long way around. McVeigh has a Filipino wife who has a home in Cebu City, Philippines. Allegedly... There's some connection between the Philippines, Terry Nichols, and a man, allegedly John no Doe No. 2, who is from those islands and is supposed to be an associate of Ramsey Youssef, who is supposed to be connected with the World Trade Center bombing. After all these attacks against patriots, the militia, fundamentalist Christians, Nation of Islam, and others, do you believe this? Who are these scum-sucking pigs? We don't understand exactly what all this is supposed to mean, but we're going to find out. The whole mess went by very quickly on the news. At this moment, all we know for sure is that the media is claiming that the FBI released this information, and all of a sudden, we're back at square one with a foreign-looking man with a foreign accent, broken English, whom the FBI denied for so long had anything to do with the bombing. Remember that? All those reassurances about no one with a foreign accent being involved in this thing? And we have much more. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read you verbatim the last paragraph of the communique from our Oklahoma station chief. Yes, it is the creeping accumulated bullshit syndrome, CABS, transmitted through the air without requiring human contact. The disease is said to be reaching epidemic proportions in all states of the Union, but has taken a remarkably strong hold in the Republic of Oklahoma, where it is said that the first cases were brought to the area by federal officials. As a result, Creeping accumulated bullshit syndrome has spread unchecked for five weeks now, infecting the entire area.
just something to give you a little chuckle and a little flint of deja vu. And now to the meat. You see, when nobody else can do it, we can. We have the best people, the only people, in fact. We have the largest and most successful civilian intelligence gathering network in the world, bar none. You want the truth, you only get it here and in the pages of Veritas. Nowhere else. Now, I'm going to read you a transcript. And I'm not going to tell you who our person is talking to Dr. Mankin of the Energy Center of the University of Oklahoma. But it is our person, and I will call this person O. O, Dr. Mankin. Dr. Mankin, hi, how are you? O, I'm fine. My name is O. Dr. Mankin, have a seat. O, I met with Dr. Luza a couple of times previously. Oh, yeah. Or Dr. Mankin. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, I thought I'd come by and see if your seismometers had picked up anything of the building falling down today. Dr. Mankin. It did indeed. We have a, well, let me say we have a record that we assume is the building falling down. Oh, mm-hmm. Dr. Mankin. It comes in at the right time. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. It's quite different from the original one we saw, and we have some other seismometers that have been set around. U.S. Geological Survey has been here, and they've added, oh, oh yeah? Dr. Mankin. They've added, we've put, USGS put two accelerometers on pretty close to the building and one a short distance away. Oh, okay. Dr. Mankin. They measure ground acceleration and direction and motion. And then they installed, I think, two portable seismic units to record data as well. And there, one of my staff members, Ray Brown, and their geologists from USGS are out at the moment retrieving the equipment and the records. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin, we have pulled our record and I've sent it into our cartographic graphing section to photograph. I want to get a permanent photographic record of it. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. So we should have a copy of that available. I don't know if I can get it done this afternoon, but certainly by in the morning we'll have some copies. Oh, okay. Dr. Mankin, it's a, the record looks different than what we saw before. It's got higher frequency. It's a lower amplitude and higher frequency up front. And then it goes from low, which looks much more like what one might see in a quarry blast. In a quarry blast, normally what you see in the blast is the falling of the rock because the blast itself is a fairly low charges like they saw we didn't see the charges and we didn't the amount of explosives they used to bring the building down were small so we didn't see i'm sure we didn't see that oh right dr mankin what we did see is the falling of the building and its signature i and again let me you know you have to understand we're interpreting this to be that because there's nothing in there that record that says this was a you know, this was the building falling, and this was the bomb blast. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin, it's an interpretation of what we see. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin, but you know it's the only rational conclusion because the timing is precise. It came in at about seven or eight seconds. It's, you know, on the record. We'll be able to see it when we look at the photographic record and get a much more accurate arrival time, but it looks like if you calculate it back to the origin, it's going to be in the neighborhood of six to eight seconds after the detonation. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. Which would make sense for the time that it takes for the building to fall, and generally a building that size probably for argument, you know, if you just looked at time yourself and timed it, when you see the blast at normal speed, it looked like about five or six seconds, and that's about what we would anticipate, and that's about what it looks like on the arrival time. Oh, yeah, Dr. Mankin. And so the record itself looks very different from the last one. Oh, well, I know that's what a lot of people are curious about, Dr. Mankin. Sure. Oh, 
So many people were saying that that second event that occurred on the 19th was either an echo or showing the floors falling down and pancaking on top of each other. Dr. Mankin. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't the building falling. Of that, of that, I'm, I guess I can, I'm pretty confident of that interpretation. It's not the building. Oh, yeah? Dr. Mankin. What it is, I still don't know. Our problem is that there's nothing in the signature of a record that says, quote, this is a blast, end quote. What we get is we get, we got a really wave, two Rayleigh waves that came in 10 seconds apart. Oh, Rayleigh waves? Dr. Mankin. Yeah, that's a surface wave. Oh, okay, right. Dr. Mankin. We saw the two surface waves that came in 10 seconds apart. Oh, yeah, Dr. Mankin. And we have interpreted it, and it's important to note that we have interpreted the first one to be the bomb blast, and it's consistent with the time, and, and it is in part by process of elimination that says we look at everything else, and we don't see anything that could have caused it, because if it had been an earthquake, which is, you know, a normal, if it had been an earthquake, then an earthquake has to be, is a deep-seated event, and it should have been picked up by some of our other seismometers in the state, and it wasn't. The only two seismometers that recorded those two events was this one and the one at the Omniplex. Oh, right, yeah, I was at the Omniplex a few days after I was here. Dr. Mankin, mm-hmm, oh, and fortunately found somebody that had made a copy of it before all the originals disappeared. Dr. Mankin. Huh? Well, that's... Oh. Were there any comments or conclusions that you could reach comparing what the Omniplex recorded and what you had recorded here on the 19th? Dr. Mankin. Oh, not really, because I didn't spend that much time looking at the Omniplex record. I looked at them. One of, my, one of my staff members, who is a theoretical seismologist, who got his Ph.D. at MIT in theoretical seismology, is very good at this sort of thing. Now, he's looked at those records, and some of his colleagues at other institutions, this, these records are being examined by some colleagues at Caltech and some at the University of Texas and other places. So a lot of people are looking at these records to uh, so that we're not by ourselves in this process and we're not our interest is to learn what we can from this because one of the things one of the things we look at is we can interpret the first event and it is an interpretation and we can relate that and we feel pretty comfortable relating that to the bomb blast we don't have any easy thing to relate the second one to because I wasn't there and I uh, you know, there have been various accounts of whether there was one or two blasts or what there was. We had originally heard there were two. That was what came over the radio. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. And so when we heard there were two and we saw these two events, the logical conclusion is to say, well, the first one looks about right for the time, and so apparently the second one relates to the second blast. Well, then, then none of the eyewitness accounts, at least that I've heard, and all I know is what I read in the newspapers or hear on television or listen, you know, and I had heard no one say that they heard a second blast. This friend of mine was up there and, in fact, happened to be within, fortunately, he was to the south or he wouldn't be here today, but he, he was about two blocks away to the south, and when the blast went, and he said it moved his van, he was stopped at a stoplight, and he said it picked up his van and moved it. It was kind of a startling event, but he's a very he's a very capable guy, and he said he has no recollection of the second event, the second blast. And I guess I have to accept the fact that while I can't explain the second event, it's hard for me to imagine that with all the people that were there, that they would not have heard a second blast ten seconds later. You know, now if it were three seconds or something, I'd say, well, maybe that's possible in the confusion, but ten seconds is a long time. Oh. I spoke with a number of people in the area. Many of the people that were closest to the building, a lot of them didn't hear a thing. Dr. Mankin, yeah? Oh, all they knew is one minute they're on one side of the room, and a second later they're on the other side. Dr. Mankin, 
Oh, yeah. If you're too close in the first place, the blast, I'm surprised, I'm really surprised, considering the magnitude of that blast, that more people didn't suffer severe hearing damage from that. That was a hell of a blast. Oh. Well, I spoke to one guy that worked at Fred Jones Ford who was standing in front of a window when it blew right in his face, and of course there were, I believe, about five blocks to the south. Dr. Mankin, yeah. Oh, and he said his ears rang all day. Dr. Mankin, well, I'm sure, absolutely. Oh, and one of his drivers out in the parking lot was outside when it happened, and he was almost deaf for two or three days. Dr. Mankin, yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm really not surprised because that would be a... You know, I'm really surprised of the people that got out of that building, that more of them haven't had exploded eardrums, eardrums destroyed. Oh, I know. Dr. Mankin. Because the air pressure, the instant pressure was so huge that it would be like suddenly finding yourself at 100 feet underwater with no, you know, instantly, with no protection. Oh. The other things that I have found out were from people that were anywhere from 10 to 20 blocks away, and there were a number of people that heard two blasts. Dr. Mankin, did they? Oh, that were that far away. Dr. Mankin, mm-hmm. Oh, the people that were close to it either didn't hear anything or they heard one thing and then, you know, your body just panics after that. Dr. Mankin, I can't. I can't either confirm or deny because I wasn't there. And all I can tell you is that there were two events. They look very similar. We've tried. We've done every analysis we can think of. We know it's not the air blast. There's no question about that. The time is dead wrong. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin, sound travels at, well, let's say 1,100 feet per second. And it's, you know, a third the speed of what something the Earth. So we calculate the distance from the center to our seismometer. If it were the air blast that affected the seismometer, which it didn't this far south, but even if it had, it should have come in at about 30 seconds late. And so it can't be the air blast. We know that. I mean, everybody has agreed to that. We cannot, well, we can't rule out a refraction. Everybody that has looked at the signal has said that would really be strange because there's absolutely no loss of energy. I mean, the same amplitude. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. So if you get a refraction, a refracted wave, you're going to get loss of energy. Oh, would that be like an echo coming off a building or something like that? Dr. Mankin, yeah, yeah, and you'll lose, you know, you'll lose a part of the energy in the process. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin, see, if you have a perfect mirror, a surface mirror, you shine a beam of light on it, and you get the reflection back, you measure the lumens, you get a loss of energy because even the most perfect one you can create still loses energy because there's it's there's an absorption of energy at that interface and that's the reason things go because part of that energy goes into that oh right dr mankin and so this incoherent scattering means that you lose some energy and so when you reflect something, it's going to be less intense than the original thing. It's a basic law of physics. And so those same principles hold true for seismic waves. So when you reflect a seismic wave, it's going to lose intensity, reflected or refracted, either principle. Oh, right. Dr. Mankin. And so the fact that the two are of equal intensity suggests either... You know, that makes it difficult. Secondly, the arrival time is wrong for a refracted wave because there's, there's nothing. You're going to have to take it off the mantle or something like that, or you're going to have to take it off of basement rocks or something. The problem with the shallow section of the Earth's crust between here and Oklahoma City is that we've got a pile of rather discontinuous sandstone and shale, a big delta called the Garber Delta. That's what we get our water out of. Oh. Right, there's a big aquifer right under here. Dr. Mankin, that's right, that's right. That's where we get our water, and it's a big delta, and the delta consists of channels of sand that go from east to west, and they're irregularly scattered through this pile of material, and there aren't coherent letters or layers from which you could get a reflection. Oh, right, Dr. Mankin, until you get some depth. And if you try to calculate the travel time down and back up, the time is wrong. 
So you'd have to get it really deep to get a 10 second layer because the arrival time, if you figure travel time, if you do the distance, let's say something is 10,000 feet, the arrival time just quits. Oh, and then it still wouldn't be the same intensity, Dr. Mankin, and it wouldn't be the same intensity. Oh, right, Dr. Mankin. So we've ruled out reflections, refractions, the air blast, and the thing I can't rule out is that there could have been fortuitous, fortuitously an earthquake somewhere. You see the problem we have when you try to calculate this thing. Oh, here, have some paper. Dr. Mankin. And at this point, Dr. Mankin begins to make a drawing of what he's describing. Is that what we have is we have a seismometer located right here. And we get a record from it. And it says that we picked up an event at some point in time. And all we can say is that if we know the travel time of a surface wave, which we do pretty well, all we can tell you, in fact, is that somewhere out here on that circle, there was an event occurred that caused that signal to arrive at this station at this time. We can calculate the travel time back to its origin. Now, that's all we can tell you. Well, that's not very much with one station. And normally, if it were an earthquake, we would say, well, that's all we can tell you. Now, what happened is, then we looked at all, you know, if it's an earthquake, however, it's deep-seated. These Rayleigh waves travel some distance, and so we thought, well, we'll check all of our other seismometers around the state and see. And normally, what we would have, we'd have another seismometer over here, and every travel time, and we'd pick up something that looks like that, and so we'd say, well, it's either here or here, and then if you have a third one over here somewhere, and it picks up here, then you say, well, that's the origin of it. But it generally takes three seismometers, simple, single orientation, or single, full seismometers, to get a determination like that. Now, what we can do with the fancier units now, we have over at the observatory, these broadband three component digital units is that we can get a phase contrast on their travel time between the three components and we can get an azimuth and we can well you know it's not precise but it's pretty close so we can or would generally with two seismometers like that you can get a pretty good fix on an earthquake but what we did in this instance listen carefully folks but what we did in this instance in the absence of these didn't pick up anything, so we said, well, it's a local phenomenon. And since it's a local phenomenon, a surface wave, it was a fairly small one. It wasn't going to travel very far. You see, what would happen the way this occurs? Let's assume this is an earthquake, and it's, say, estimated at, say, maybe 10 miles down or something. What you do is you get energy coming in a cone out from that. And so this thing would come out, and we'd pick up a surface wave, and this would pick up a surface wave, and this would pick up a surface wave, and so on, on its depth, because the energy would come up, hit the surface, and then go out like this. Oh, right. Dr. Manton. Okay. So that's why you pick up from an earthquake. You pick up surface waves some distance away. But here, this particular event, all we did, we knew the building was blasted. We knew where it was. We had the seismometer. We got this record. We said, okay, if it were this building, then this first event would have occurred at 902 plus 4 seconds. And if you took the signal, if you look at the signal, it looks very much like a quarry blast, very much like some of the information you expect. So our interpretation of this event, absent this other information, is that that was the building being blown up. And so that's how we arrived at this, and this is an interpretation. Now that was confirmed in an indirect way by the Omniplex sitting up here. It picked up two events. Unfortunately, their clock was malfunctioning, so we couldn't get an absolute number. But we saw the two events, and we saw the two events here, and we said this was closer, it should have higher amplitude, and it did. There should be two events if we're recording the same thing. It had two events, and we had two events. We said these two, and looking that, at that information, and looking at this information, we tend to corroborate our interpretation. And so, folks, Dr. Mankin confirms that the two events on the two seismographic reports are the same events, they believe that the first one is the blast at the building, the federal building in Oklahoma City. 
And at first they said that the second one was a second blast. And then when the government and the news said that there was only explosion, they began to backpedal. How about that? So, what we've got here, folks, is a lot of significant information. And by the way, this this uh, synopsis of this will be published in issue number four. And now, remember when they picked up the guy in Oatman, Arizona? The first news report said that the FBI and the federal agencies had examined the brown pickup truck owned by this guy. And I'm not going to repeat his name because he hasn't been found guilty of anything. They said they found residue of explosives, the same kind used in Oklahoma City, in this brown pickup truck. Well, they've since had to backpedal. You see, apparently they were trying to frame this guy. All the neighbors all around there have told our agents that that pickup truck has not moved and nobody has been in it or near it for six months, and they're all willing to swear to that. Also, the FBI is going back to the original reports of a late model brown Chevy truck with tinted windows and smoked bug deflector driven by men of Middle Eastern appearance. They tie this to Nichols because he married a woman named Marithi Brewery of this year. Now, let me go back and tell you this again. <laughs> because I'm telling you something that I'm getting sick and tired of these lies and the deceptions and the manipulation that these scum-sucking pigs are throwing out the American people. These are scum, puke-based liars, and that's the truth. The FBI is going back to the original reports of a late-model brown Chevy truck with tinted windows and smoked bug deflector driven by men of Middle Eastern appearance. After they drug every patriot and every true American in this country through the mud and the scum of their media propaganda service. Circus, I should say. I'm very angry right now. I'm just holding in my anger. This is unacceptable. I'm telling you, this is going to backfire on them. This could just destroy this country. And that's exactly what these people have set out to do. They're going back to the original reports of a late model brown Chevy truck with tinted windows and smoked bug detector driven by men of Middle Eastern appearance. They tie this to Nichols. Why? Because he has a Filipino wife and purchased a house in Cebu, Cebu City in the Philippines, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the Middle East. He also was living for several months with his wife in the Philippines from late 1994 to February of this year. And I'm telling you right now, every Navy veteran and Marine veteran and Army veteran who married Filipino women and have lived in the Philippines, you're in great danger right now because now it's swinging around to you. And all of you Filipino men and women who served in the armed forces of the United States of America, you better go hide. The FBI now says that the Philippines are a hotbed of radical Islamic groups and terrorist activities. The FBI is investigating any links that may exist between Terry Nichols and a suspected, a suspect that was arrested in Manila and extradited to the United States. That suspect is believed to be associated with Ramzi Youssef, an alleged co-conspirator conspirator in the World Trade Center bombings. The suspect's name was not given, but I'll give you a suspect's name that we have proved in the last issue of Veritas was involved in the World Trade Center bombings, and that's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They say that Nichols also left a list of phone numbers and address for his ex-wife, Lana Padilla, to be used in the event of his arrest or death. A friend, shown in dark shadow with his voice disguised, said that the voice had the names and addresses of Terry's wife, Marifi, in the Philippines, and her aunt in California, and other folks in the Philippines. Friends of Marifi, the wife, say she was seen with John Doe number 2 and Terry in the Philippines, and that is all that was said about it so far. 
Hillary Shalala, Reno Janet Dyke, reading the words of General Albert Pike, demonic founder of the Ku Klux Klan, engineer of the Masonic Master Plan. Pike said, Lucifer is God across this land. And what he's saying takes the mark. And now two men have been shot tonight on the grounds of the White House. Just exactly what do you think is coming next? A two-year-old can predict the future with 100% accuracy. Crisis creation in white, black, and white program education. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a loud knock on your door. Hey, honey. Something's not right. Hillary Shalala, Reno Janet Dyke, reading the words of General Albert Pike, the money founder of the Ku Klux Klan, engineer of the Masonic Master Plan. Pike said, Lucifer is God across this land. And what he's saying takes the mark in your right hand. So we're all dancing to the drums of up four. Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of the time is brought to you by Swiss America Trading. And I suggest, in view of all that's been happening lately, if you don't have some real money in your hands now, you had better get some, and I mean really quick. Because, well, I'm not, I'm not even going to get into that. I mean, if you're so blind as you can't see what's going on and what the likely outcome of it's going to be, then there's nothing I can say, period, in a hundred years that's going to light that bulb inside your head between your ears. So if I were you, and I'm not, and I already have taken all the precautions, I would call Swiss America Trading. And I would talk to them about getting some real silver coins or gold coins, at least as a part of my assets, in order that if these things come to pass, I wouldn't lose everything. You see, gold and silver is always worth the same amount over the centuries as it ever was at any time during those centuries, measured in exchange. In other words, you can buy the same number of loaves of bread today as you could in the year 1602, or 1922, or the year 1007, or the year 321. It's a fact. So you're not going to make a killing, and I'm not advising you to do this in order to make a whole lot of money by investing in gold or silver. I'm advising that you think about doing this in order to preserve at least some of your assets against an imminent catastrophe that could happen at any moment in this country. For instance, in the wake of the Oklahoma City bombing, with people being shot on the White House lawn tonight, you might, you might see declaration of martial law before morning. I don't know, and I'm not predicting that. I'm just telling you that that's the climate that we're living in at the moment. And I'm going to tell you, because I have studied these things in the past, that these incidents of terror will escalate 
I hope to God that I am wrong, but I know in my heart that I am right. So call Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And take care of business, folks. Look around at the faces of your loved ones if you cannot assure them right now that you've taken steps to protect them in the event of an imminent economic collapse. Then you must make this call or else you don't really love them. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. You know how we all tend to procrastinate. Another Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, create the panic and rape the nation. Order Crisis creation. In tight black and white programs, agitation. Trust is your right hand. Well, we're all dancing with the drums of Buffalo Christ. Clinton's preparing it for another huge Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, create the panic and rape the nation. Crisis creation. In tight black and white programs, agitation. Well, we're all dancing to the drums of Buffalo Christ. Clinton's preparing it for another huge Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, create the panic and rape the nation. Order. Crisis creation. In tight black and white programs, agitation. All dancing to the drums of Buffalo Christ. Clinton's preparing it for another huge tax hike. Order. Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, create the panic and rape the nation. Order. Crisis creation. In tight black and white programs, agitation. With the drums of Buffalo Bright, Clinton's preparing it for another huge Sorry, folks. Wasn't trying to promote that recording. <laughs> I was trying to get my hands on something that just came over to facts. Yes, what? I'm going to read you this. Quote, The American community must be better protected against domestic and international terrorism. Louis Farrakhan's hatred of Jews is re relentless and must be fought. Church-state separation and hate crimes are on the agenda of the current Congress, and ADL's voice must be heard. Dear friend, I know I've recently written to you about ADL's efforts to counter Louis Farrakhan's continuing campaign of hatred and bigotry. I also shared our report on the continuing rise in anti-Semitic incidents of violence, assaults, arson, threats, and harassment in America. I am writing now because the terrorist bombing in Oklahoma has made ADL's long-standing fight against anti-democratic extremists all the more important. I wanted to send you our most current summary report on the militia movement and ADL's early responses to the tragic events in Oklahoma. It's also frighteningly clear that Farrakhan's relentless hatred of Jews is growing ever more extreme, and I need, needed to share with you our most recent documentation of his ugly bigotry. ADL simply must have your help now to more effectively respond to the threat of, quote, right-wing domestic terrorism, end quote, and to expose and fight back against Farrakhan's and the Nation of Islam's dangerous anti-Semitism. At this same time, the Congress has begun to debate proposed legislation on a series of issues high on ADL's agenda of concern. 
church-state separation, hate crimes, and domestic and international terrorism. I've also enclosed special briefing papers we've prepared on several of the key domestic political issues the new Congress is dealing with that impact on ADL's fight against bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism. We need your financial support at this special time to help strengthen our ability to monitor and expose anti-democratic extremists and fight haters like Farrakhan. ADL must also have your help now to ensure our voice is heard on the critical domestic political issues most directly affecting our community. If you have not yet responded to my earlier appeal for your support, I hope you will take the time today to make a gift to strengthen ADL's work. We need your continuing support more than ever. Even if you have made a recent contribution, I hope you will now consider making an additional special contribution. Sincerely, Abraham H. Foxman, 823 United Nations Plaza, New York, New York. Now, I could go on and on and on here, but I don't really think I have the time tonight. So maybe, let me see. I'm looking for the one on the militias here. On April 19, 1995, this is from the same letter. On April 19, 1995, a large truck bomb destroyed the Mura Federal Building in Oklahoma City on the two-year anniversary of the government confrontation on the Branch Davidian Compound in Waco, Texas. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, ATF, had initially attempted to seize illegal weapons and make arrests. Branch Davidian members resisted with arms, killing four ATF agents, and remained under siege for several weeks until a second assault by law enforcement officials when the compound burst into flame, leaving more than 80 group members dead. At first, law enforcement in the country at large believed that the Oklahoma explosion was the work of international terrorists. However, as the investigation unfolded, and listen to this, folks, it became evident that the suspects in this incident appear to have connections with far-right militant groups which call themselves militias. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if we're back on the air, but, uh, and I don't know why we got cut off, but it uh, looks like we are back on the air. Looks like somebody's playing with this broadcast, and uh, we all know why, don't we? This is the only place you get the truth. Now, let me explain something to all of you listening out there who might be listening for the first time. I am not anti-Semitic or racist. My wife is Chinese. The people who work in this center are of different racial backgrounds. The ADL is not Jews. It is an organization which manipulates all of us and tells an awful lot of lies. And they are scaring people to death and filking money out of their pockets because they're going to be imminently attacked by right-wing, racist, white supremacist militias. And it's a lie. 
We've exposed the criminal activities of the Anti-Defamation League before. We've exposed their ties to international espionage, spying upon the American people and the American government, and sending that information to foreign governments, which included South Africa at one point. We exposed the fact that during the racial strife of the 60s, that they were involved in creating racial incidents to pit the races together. And we also exposed the fact that they have been caught red-handed taking out permits for KKK and Nazi groups to fuel dissension among the races in cities in America. Caught red-handed. And then they would go into the Jewish community and say, see, the KKK and the Nazis have taken out a permit to have a parade, and they would incite the Jewish community. And pretty soon, there would be violence. On one memorable occasion, the press found out about it and published a front-page story that said, Nazis who took out the parade permit really Jews. But it wasn't Jews, folks. It was the ADL. We are all manipulated. All of us. We are manipulated to think that we have to hate each other and to fight each other. And every time we do that, we fuel the purpose of those who would destroy this great nation, who would bring us to our knees and enslave us all. And I'm telling you now, don't fall for it. Don't bite on it. The ADL is one of the most despicable groups in this country. And they're pulling their baloney again. Listen to this. Listen to this. At first, law enforcement in the country at large believed that the Oklahoma explosion was the work of international terrorists. However, as the investigation unfolded, it became evident that the suspects in this incident appear to have connections with far-right militant groups which call themselves militias. In October 1994, the ADL issued a 28-page fact-finding report entitled, quote, Armed and Dangerous, Militias Take Aim at the Federal Government, end quote. October 94. When that happened, I read their report in its entirety on the air, and I stated that just as always, when the ADL attacks a group, the entire country would follow suit. And that's exactly what happened. Their report highlighted the proliferation of militias in America. The ADL's findings were based on a survey which found evidence of militia activity in 13 states. Since that report, and I'm reading directly from their report now, Quote, ADL has recorded militia activity in at least another 11 states, including Texas, New York, Pennsylvania, and California. Militias are now active in every region of the United States. Quote, generally, the militias are heavily armed bands of right-wing extremists, many of whom view the federal government as their primary enemy. Many engage in paramilitary training and the stockpiling of weapons and supplies in preparation for an inevitable war with the government. They are driven by the view that a conspiratorial federal government in league with the United Nations or a new world order is relentlessly subverting their rights, particularly the right to bear arms. The choice of the term militia stems from its inclusion in the language of the Constitution's Second Amendment on the right to keep and bear arms. Gun control is seen as part of a government conspiracy to disarm and control its citizens, end quote. All of this, all of it, is lies. And I have proven to you that this is not a conspiracy, and we've proven it with treaties, with the law, with government documents, with the congressional record, with the Federal Register and all of the documentation and resolutions of the United Nations. And tomorrow night, ladies and gentlemen, because I am so angry, I'm going to take a little vacation and you're going to hear a rerun. And if you listen very carefully, you might hear some things that might help you wake up. You see, because we don't just say things on this broadcast. We document it. We prove it.
For those of you who are coming to the conference, if you're not already here, I look forward to greeting you at the door. If you're a member of the press, don't bother coming because you have been discredited in our eyes. Anyone who is not a member of the press, and I don't care who you are, is welcome if you pay your fee. The press is never welcome until you learn to tell the truth. You're a bunch of puke-faced scumbag liars. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless each and every single one of you. And I hope, very sincerely, that you learn to be Americans, not Democrats, not Republicans, not black, not white, not purple, not green, not Jews, not Buddhists, but Americans. <laughs> Welcome to the new world <laughs> Never in human history has so few taken so much from so many as America's Illuminati and their warlords of Wall Street and Washington. In just eight years, these gangsters and international government gangsters took us from the greatest creditor nation to the largest debtor nation on Earth. Our standard of living has dropped like a rock for four out of every five Americans. They have foreclosed on our homes, our farms, our factories. They've exported your jobs and surrendered our arms. A new world order. A new world order. The Illuminati wants you to be a slave from birth to grave. The banks who own the Federal Reserve is private. They own it. It's neither federal nor a reserve. The cash is made that the funny money stuff you call dollars for two pennies. They lend it back to us at full face value. They charge you interest, do you get the debt? They get the interest. They get the gold, you get the debt. They want it. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. It is a big idea. A new world order. CFR controls the CIA, the FBI, the ATF, and the FDA. They don't give a damn about the POW and the MIA. Hillary, Hillary, Hitler, Marx, and Mao. They want a new world order. They want it all. And they want it now. This Illuminati imports the dope. They create the chaos. Spring is down. Crush our hope. They created AIDS. It's their designer disease. To bring you down. To drop on your knees. They want to vaccinate your child and give them the mark. They want to illuminate you and keep you in the dark. They want you to pay for it with plastic, surrender your soul. They want you under their thumb, under their control. They want it all. A new world order. A new world order. 